Okay, I'll go to live. I hope we are live. Mm, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay, great. Day two. Yeah. So, okay, yeah, I also made another Google Drive and I put um, the example files of today and also this. I, I saw the them, they look great. Way. I think they look good. So basically, I uploaded them and now everybody can, can get them. Okay. Um, There's a cool lecture today. I don't know if you saw about adaptive skins. Oh, did he? Yeah, but we'll miss it. <laughs> Where from from AEC? Yeah. Should I start admitting? Um... Yeah. Oh yeah. I guess. Yeah. I guess now it's time. Hello, people. Hi, Azim, Rashmi, and Nasu. Hi. Salam. Hello. Hello. How are you guys? Good. How are you? Good. What, what time is it over there in LA? It is 5.01 a.m. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I take a little nap after this workshop and then get going for the day. Yeah, that, that, <laughs> that sounds necessary. Marina, where are you? I'm in Sao Paulo, Brazil. <laughs> oh, what time is it there? 9 a.m. Okay, that's not too bad. No, it's good. It's good, actually. Good. I think for people in Iran, it should be 4.30 in the afternoon, which is okay. And for us in Germany, it's 2 p.m. I 
I think we should have two more uh, or one more, maybe. Um, yeah. Um, I think Zeresh did. Oh, right. She said she needs to teach a class today and she will watch the. Okay. We have a recording later. And I don't Jesse, know. I'm also um, logged in from my friend's laptop. Okay. Hi. So you are Ali and Ali is Ali, right. right. Okay. <laughs> the, the webcam has a problem in, in this laptop, sorry. It's okay. Um, yeah, I think we had an Amir yesterday. So let's see if he will join. Maybe we can give him two more minutes, otherwise we'll start. Oh, we have a new person. Uh, it's possible that there were some who couldn't join on the first day, so. Okay, maybe we can, should we start? Yeah, I think so. I think if they're a few more bit late, then we'll, we'll just help them later. Yeah. Okay, so hello everybody. Welcome to the second day of our workshop. It's great to see you back. And we can, um, I think we can start in a few moments, but I was, um, I was taking a look at the list. I think one person, uh, Ferishta told us yesterday that she will not be able to join today, uh, which is okay. And I think we had one more person missing, which might come later. And I think Emily uh, is joining us today. She was not here yesterday, but hi, Emily. Okay. So I can't hear you. I don't know if you muted or something, but it's all good. Um, but just so you know, we have recorded yesterday's session and you can watch it live on YouTube. If you haven't watched it yet, and if you want to follow along, maybe that would be good because we are going to build on the things we talked about yesterday. So actually, I don't know. Uh, so we have, so for today, we will have one lecture um, that Tiffany is going to give you. It is more on the topic of 4D printing, uh, 3D printing with hygroscopic materials and bioinspiration. So that would take around, I think, half an hour. Then I will give a lecture about self-shaping origami. And after that, we are going to get to the tutorial. So we have a digital file, um, a new file that we've put on the shared folder. And yeah, that is basically for designing uh, origamis and see how they fold. And then we will have the hands-on tutorial similar to what we had yesterday. But I was thinking that before we start with Tiffany's lecture, maybe you guys want to show us some stuff if you have made uh, Kirigami things since yesterday, it would be, I think, a great way to start today. Should we do that? Okay, who wants to go first? Oh, cool, Rasul. You made the Kirigami pattern. Oh, you unmuted. Yes, uh, last night I tried to build one of these. Uh, yeah. 
Cool. Yeah, it looks great. Thank you. Perfect. Um, did you put it in the water first and then a shape change with drying or did you make the bilayer in dry and you put water? Um, no, I, I just spray water on it. And oh, right now. Okay. Okay, great. <laughs> yeah, it looks really good. Thank awesome. Thank you. I just sprayed water on mine as well. Oh, yay. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Yeah, it looks good. Yeah, I think I sprayed too much water yesterday when I was uh, first testing it out and my paper weight that I used um, wasn't too strong. And so a couple of the rows kind of teared, but yeah. it was a good learning experience. Yeah. <laughs> And the rest of it looks fine, so. Yeah, it looks good. Cool. I want to spray now. <laughs> oh, Shin, that looks great. That's, that that's looks awesome. Very nice, wow. Is it actuated? Uh, no. Uh, she will spray water patterns, now. And I try to ex. And I try to extend this pattern like this. Yes, that looks really nice. At, at first, uh, I do this and so interesting, your pattern. Oh, nice. <laughs> oh, you did a lot. Cool. Now I'm spraying water. <laughs> mm. Oh, they are coming alive. Beautiful. Yes. So there is one thing I'm going to first say it in English and then in Farsi that, see, in your pattern, you have different directions of cuts. And I think now you might be able to see that some of them would fold better than the other because some of them are in the direction of the paper and some of them are kind of in the opposite direction, like the ones from the top, uh, like the, the, the row. So that, that gets a little bit tricky if you want to make this pattern work perfectly. You might want to cut some papers from another paper that that direction and put it there. Or do you, know, do you understand what I mean? Yeah, like, so I'm going to say it in Farsi now, that اون مثلا واسه این مسلسه که الان تکون نمیخوره شاید کار بهتر نشه که اون تیکه ها رو آره دقیقا دقیقا اونا مثلا از یه کاغذ دیگه ببوری که با جهتش جهتش فرق کنی متوجه شده آره ولی خیلی با حاله This is really nice Very interesting Thank you I have this, and these are all so nice. I, I <laughs> want to take, um, so after we are all done, you should all show your things, and I will take a screenshot of, of our Zoom okay. call. I think but that would be good. Okay, now it's dry. I want to make it wet. <laughs> Everyone has to prepare paper for the photo shoot. Thick <laughs> and the pieces. I don't know if it is. It, can you see this? It's very nice. That's also a very cool pattern. Yeah, and in your pattern, they are oriented all on yes, paper fiber direction. I wanted direction. to try that type, but I think uh, I thought that it can't be. Uh, uh, yeah, so, you know, the thing is that it would it, it kind of works, but just not perfectly. Mm -hmm. That some of them open less than the others. So, but, or like some of them might twist a little bit, which might be something you want to have actually in the design. But if you orient all of them, then it's really, really nice, Saba. Yeah. 
I, th I think that um, I mean it's it's really interesting to actually make things because then you learn even if it's it's uh, somewhat of a mistake I think you always still learn okay maybe the next design I have to somehow um, design in like a certain direction and or like the weights have to be more evenly distributed when it's um, when it's drying so I think it's really uh, for for me like the physical um, you learn so much from them every yeah, time you yeah. make it. <laughs> hey, great. Next, who, is, who wants to go next? I did one, but it didn't really work because it started uh, crackling the paper. Uh, and I think I cut it on the, the border, so we started folding. Uh, so maybe I should have uh, made it continuous on the border. So that but it, might just be... like Tiffany said, like you learn when you do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but I think there is also something with the pattern. I tried to create a new pattern, like uh mo different modules so here is small here is large uh -huh, yeah 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 the thing is when you have like two of these strips right and mm -hmm. one of them is like bending this way one of them is bending this way sorry mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm they should be connected to each other from the middle so that oh. this one goes this way this one goes this way and they kind of like sit on top of each other and then the mm -hmm. next one the next one I think you connected them like end to end. Yes, yes. Right, like this, and they kind of block each other. Mm -hmm. So you need to like shift, shift them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. But yes, best way to learn. Yeah. <laughs> and I started another one diag diagonally, but I didn't finish yet. It's, it's super com complicated. You have to do like one yeah. side and then the other way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But awesome. I'm so happy that you see you all tried this, these cool things. Cool. Yeah, I had a little bit of a stumble too. Oh, yesterday when I tried it, I did see like a pattern in one part of it. Yeah. But now when I tried spring water again, I think it got too damp because my paper is too thin. Yeah. So it's, it's just like warping entirely. But yeah, I think I figured like, there's probably a few mistakes in it, I think. So and I think that yours is also the same as Marina. Right. Do you think the, the, the two ones on top of each other, are they connected like kind of end to end or middle yeah. to middle? They are connected. I, I'm not sure I, I know. I am Let me see. Me. Okay, right. So you see this pattern? Yeah. Ah, oh, no, mine's end to end. It's not the middle. Yeah, and then it kind of, I mean, this is a nice surface structure. You see, it's like a, one of these weaving pattern, but yeah. it doesn't get to this kind of expansion. It remains on the surface. Yeah, so what I noticed was uh, a pattern that was more like two and a half D where just a few of them uh, were curved. Yeah. So it was interesting when I, when I did it yesterday, but then I think when I tried it now again, that activated it, just like this end I think is curved from yesterday so it's not <laughs> yeah. but the rest of it's just like started to die out so yeah I should try with thicker paper maybe yeah and uh, this is I mean you can still see that it's an interesting pattern even though yeah. it's like too soft right now but yeah for this kind of stretching you would need to yeah sure uh, thank you yeah. so who wants to go next?
Anyone else? Okay. Sorry. Uh, um... Okay. So I think also Ali and Ali Reza had problem with their webcam. So I, uh, okay. I assume they can't show. Mm. So let's let's take our let's take our photo. <laughs> <laughs> the cool things we have. Um, <laughs> awesome cool great okay so i think we are we can start with the first lecture okay energy. great uh let me gesture my screen Okay, and then all right. Um, everyone sees this okay and hears me? Okay, great. Okay, so um, in today's lecture, I will show in more detail some of the um, projects on 4D printing um, using the hygroscopic biocomposite materials. And yesterday, um, as a quick recap, we saw how we could learn from some of the biological role models that we see in nature and transform these um, very clever design strategies into the design and construction of these autonomously actuated bilayer mechanisms that you see on the right. Um, so this wood-based material system um, ICD has been researching for architectural systems and um, uh, that respond to the climate's relative humidity. We also saw that we could design and construct the interior structure of an object similar in some ways to the grain of wood or even paper that we saw yesterday and using fused filament fabric fabrication or um, fused deposition modeling 3D printing. Um, this allows us to fully control the extrusion of various materials uh, line by line in the code. And uh, finally, we saw that we could achieve a similar type of shape change using both conventional and custom engineered thermoplastic filaments. And now, um, so now, um, you know, we can customize the internal anisotropic and hygroscopic mesostructure through 3D printing. And um, personally, I'm quite interested in biology, so uh, today I'm going to explain how we take some of the really uh, ingenious strategies that we see in nature and trans them, uh, transfer them to technical 3D printed systems. So in this first project I show, we're going to apply a specific idea from biology to the design of a self-tightening wearable device. And um, for example, is this video? Oh no, the video is not playing. <laughs> okay, uh, well, so in the video, the, you will see that this, um, you would see that this vine is climbing on this pole and as it's climbing, the force is expanding. So a lot of these um, climbing plants have, you know, this anisotropic and hygroscopic tissues, which allow them to generate uh, quite high squeezing forces for climbing very smooth supports without slipping off. And they do this by adapting to the host structure. And if you're interested in actually seeing this um, video and more about this uh, plant, um, the biologist Sandrine Isnard and her colleagues uh, studied this incredible ability of the air potato plant um, to tension itself using these stipules uh, that you see here on the right. Um, so basically it expands in size as, as it grows. And um, feel free to refer to this, uh, uh, this um, paper if you're interested in learning more about the plant. But basically we took this idea and we abstracted and transferred this tensioning mechanism to 3D printing. So um, the squeezing forces are set up in basically two phases. First, the stem helix is uh, loosely winding about its support structure. 
And um, then in the second step, it pushes out with the stipules in order to stiffen the stem helix. So um, we took this principle and uh, abstracted it into a twisting strip, a twisting bilayer strip, which we call the helix mechanism. And the second part as a bilayer flap, which we call the pocket mechanism. And the reason is because it, um, the bilayer flap actuates and creates a pocket of space between itself, the helix, and the pole uh, or the support structure. So uh, remember what Yassi explained yesterday about the grain orientation in the paper and in, in general in the bilayer systems. So by 3D printing the path in various angles, um, various spacing offsets, and in various heights, these are all things that affect the programming of the bilayer mechanism. So for example, um, notice that in uh, B and C, uh, the porosity or like the spacing in the restrictive layer affects the bending stiffness. So similar, um, this is similar to the, to the idea or like the um, concept we saw yesterday um, in yesterday's exercise when we added the extra pieces of tape to the paper. Or if you look at D, um, you know, the increased depth of the actuating layer also impacts the time scale of the shape change. And we also saw this um, with the thicker papers like the cardstock. So um, multiple of these bilayer mechanisms can also be combined to uh, create different types of shape changes. They can also be stacked on top of each other and um, also be programmed with a, gr a graded or decaying uh, bending properties. Uh, these might be ideas that you want to try in your next um, experiments. And also we can uh, rotate the grain and control the twist angle. So we also saw this with the paper exercise where we, um, the, the grain is the, co the coordinate system of the um, piece. And if you uh, orient the strips in different directions, then you get twisting or you get uh, bending uh, in the straight direction. So, uh, and also the amount of bending. So um, this could be, you know, through uh, the number of layers in the paper, um, different types of paper that we saw yesterday. So this uh, computational design process for 3D printing allowed us to quickly and easily program different configurations of the helix mechanism um, and tailor the self-shaping behaviors, uh, for example, by creating variations in the direction, or as you can see here, the amount of bending within a strip of varying widths. So the pocket mechanism is, uh, the, the second mechanism is a combination of several different components that are connected by hinges. And they work together to create this pocket of space that you see and push the helix away from the support structure. So um, maybe I just play this again. So the helix um, on the bottom and this flap on the top creating this pocket of space, which is pushing the structure. And here you can see that uh, we can design um, something to transform from a initially flat geometry to tightly wrapping around the support structure. And we also um, actually measured the squeezing forces of our 3D printed mechanism. So um, we found that we were actually able to generate the same range of forces that we saw in the original plant, plant model and that graph that I showed um, earlier. Uh, when we copy the amount of stipules, this expanding um, mechanism in low quantities. And um, in the plant, as it's found in nature, uh, that's, uh, there's usually a low quantity of them. But actually, um, if we print more of them, we actually can increase the, uh, the squeezing forces, which is quite interesting. And we also envisioned how this workflow uh, might be used by non-experts in digital modeling. So for example, medical experts and prototyped a design process where um, you know, medical experts could physically prototype designs on the body, 3D scan, and then generate the fabrication data for additive manufacturing and finally self shape into the device. So this is the result of the splint design with the self-tightening mechanism. And um, it wraps around the wrist and forearm at varying curvatures. 
But uh, I think the interesting takeaway that I, I want to also um, emphasize is that when we um, increase the number of these stipules, we were actually able to generate higher forces. And so what's interesting is that um, after studying and understanding nature, we can use computational design and 3D printing to actually extend beyond what nature can achieve. And um, almost similar to the idea of just taking a princi the principle of wood, uh, by understanding the active uh, properties of it, we can make it do pretty spe spectacular things. So just a summary of this project, um, it's a, it's, it's a, a biomimetic process that takes this self-tightening behavior of the plant, transferred, uh, trans transfer it to 4D printing through the design of the mesostructure and replicate and extend the um, squeezing forces that we see in the original plant and um, use it for applications where the fit and grip is important. So, um, so I, I work a lot on uh, wearable devices, actually, and the reason is I think the human body is a very fascinating, fascinating case study on how uh, self-shaping can be used for wearable systems um, or other products that need to interface with the body because um, the body is really dynamic and um, self-shaping is, uh, is, is a really great um, tool to interface with that. And so here's another wearable device that integrates um, variations in shape, properties, and textures, and, and which showcases um, different areas that locally um, change shape to, for example, release pressure on sensitive areas, um, have soft areas, especially for allowing the pattern to stretch and conform onto the hand, um, an area where you can insert something with much higher stiffness for um, aligning or immobilizing the wrist forearm. And also uh, we can embed, uh, for example, magnets um, for holding the splint closed. So uh, another point about 3D printing is that um, one of the main benefits uh, of additive manufacturing is that the printing pattern actually plays a pretty big role in the resulting mechanical properties of um, the part. So for example, when more material is being printed, um, the, the stiffness increases of the part. Whereas when you print less material, for example, um, the, um, there's more flexibility and, and we can even print things like auxetic patterns, which have very interesting um, uh, behaviors, mechanical behaviors. And so here you can see all of the different parts combined and the intricate material structure that we have um, printed. And uh, in a, in a close-up view here, um, the adaptive shape-changing areas um, and the, the directional qualities and stiffness and flexibility that we can 3D print in one process. So, um, that, that's just some applications that I wanted to show in um, on the body. Uh, but I guess many of you uh, are probably architects and wondering what 3D printing can offer at the building scale. So um, especially in regard to self-shaping. So yesterday we learned briefly about the Erbach Tower, which uses self-shaping for the manufacturing of curved timber components in architecture. And um, Again, the behavior of these uh, wood uh, bilayers depend on you know, how the boards were sawn um, in, in the log and the, the grain that results and the natural variation that also is in each board, uh, which is very hard to control. And so um, it's also uh, quite difficult if you want to create more complex geometries um, with a high resolution of um, double curvature or, or just other types of mechanisms. So um, in this next project that I show is um, combining the self-shaping behavior of wood with 3D printing um, using robotic fabrication. So the idea is that wood is uh, very responsive. It's easy to scale um, and easy to build volume with, whereas uh, 3D printing um, is able to produce a high resolution of detail and um, you're able to customize the physical properties as we saw earlier. 
um, to a high degree. So, um, so here we are trying to combine and merge the best of uh, both worlds, the, of both materials into one system so that we can create these bio-inspired uh, systems, cell-shaping systems at larger scale. So, um, so, so now we're actually moving from the desktop scale to the, um, to the robotic scale. And so um, this is our, our lab at um, ICD in Bangen, um, Stuttgart. The, it's called the Computational Construction Lab, and we have um, a, a variety. We have mainly working on one robot that you see on the right, um, a KUKA robot on a 12-meter uh, track. And um, in this uh, setup, we are using um, multiple end effectors. So with, the, with that one robot, we are using a uh, end effector for large format extrusion, and then also a vacuum gripper for the pick and placement of the wood uh, bilayers. And the idea is that um, everything is fabricated flat, you know, very similarly to the 3D printing projects um, that, I, that I show. And um, once it's fabricated, we uh, deploy it on site. So um, with the pre-programmed behaviors. So the, um, I guess the challenge here was to transition from that desktop scale that we did most of our research on to this large scale. And so um, that uh, essentially meant that we um, took some of the principles that we learned from 3D printing, um, the parameters for, for creating these different properties. Um, so like the stiffness of the material, the flexibility, um, and we calibrate it using the large scale uh, system. And we're actually using a biocomposite thermoplastic that's also very similar to the wood um, filaments that we showed before. Um, it's also using cellulose fillers. Um, and uh, um, yeah, so uh, because we're using this larger nozzle, um, the, the, um, the bead that comes out or like the pass, the material pass are actually uh, much uh, larger. And so, the, so actually the tool path is, is quite important and we had to design um, a, a very specific tool path that was continuous and actually not crossing, which would then break the continuity of the fibers. So, um, so when we actually print this, we print the base materials and then um, actually let's just um, yeah, show again. So we print the base material and then we place the wood by layers and then encase it. And here is um, the structure self-shaping uh, over a week. And um, the size is uh, the span or like the size of this is 80 um, centimeters. So it's significantly much larger than what we made before. And, um, and yeah, so um, the idea is that we could create um, these large scale self-shaping structures. And here we see a design of a uh, three-legged uh, structure tripod uh, where we are creating um, legs where it's very stiff at the end, which it can, which can support the structure you know, from the bottom and that bends um, at the top uh, to create these, ar these arches coming together. And, um, and on the right, you see the, the cell shaping um, um, and, the, and the dimensions. So, so it reached a height of 42 centimeters. And, um, and also what might be interesting is that in the same uh, event, the Digital Futures um, uh, conference this year that happened uh, uh, just a few days ago on, on Saturday, um, our, some of our, our iTech students also presented uh, their work, which um, builds upon this concept of self-shaping uh, bilayers and 3D printing. So if you're interested in um, um, that, that line of work, the large scale um, work, then feel free to check out their publication with the, the references um, is here below um, the paper. I think the, you can even watch their uh, lecture, it's still online. Okay, so um, that's that's a summary of uh, our 4D printing work, or at least some of our 4D printing work. And um, I, I think uh, what I what I tried to show is also how a lot of these concepts are really applicable to um, these physical models that you're making. So 
um, you know, we're, we're also printing in this uh, 2.5D sort of uh, um, um, process, which I think if you, if you maybe look at this, um, you can find a lot of analogies to paper um, cell shaping. Okay, so um, are there any questions um, from anyone? Or any inspirations that you find in uh, some of the uh, projects that you want to do. So I think really a lot of the, the programming that we're doing with 3D printing is, is very similar. You just have to look for these connections. So um, I think I'm, I'm, all, I'm also very excited to try to take some of these ideas and also make, um, make myself in paper. Uh, Tiffany, can I ask a question? Yeah. So, um, so what I what I didn't uh, fully get is that when when the printing prints the uh, the grids, which which you showed earlier on the um, on the wood panel, uh, does it also? So one one thing is this grid, and the other thing is that does it also controls the direction of the uh, grains in the in the material? So these two work both hand in hand when, when the uh, final form emerges or, or that's another thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you're talking about this project or the other 3D printing, just so I can- I think it was the next, uh, or the next, uh, uh, yeah, this one. Okay, okay. So yeah, um, yeah. So let me just go back to here, right? Um, the idea is that the wood is performing the cell shaping um, behavior. It's, it's what's um, creating the bending. And uh, the 3D printing is not necessarily uh, responsive, but you can program different properties, different stiffnesses, different um, elasticity uh, into the, uh, or, or even different weights, right? Um, to the material. So, um, some of the prop some of the um, parameters that we have to work with are, for example, the um, aspect ratio, which controls the anisotropy, right? Um, so if you have a square that is more horizontal, then you're going to introduce more stiffness in the horizontal direction and more flexibility in the vertical direction. Um, another thing is, you know, you can by by changing the density or the, the thickness of the lines, then you're changing the cell or you're sorry, you're changing the um, stiffness uh, and also the weight. So it's, uh, so when we put them together, um, you can see here that uh, the wood is uh, bending uh, both in the same uh, angle, but different directions. And so in the middle here, we wanted to create uh, longer print paths in spanning that direction, um, spanning that uh, the two bilayers. Uh, so it's much more stiff and can transfer the forces, but we also want it to be very flexible um, in the direction that the, the wood is bending, right? Um, and then, you know, in the between, we can also have different patterns that allow it to stretch a little bit. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I, I think I understood some, some part of it, but what I have a hard time understanding is that uh, here we don't have a, like, a planar material like wood, which has a direction of the grain. You, you're walking on the, uh, the way you, you create this form is by walking in, in, in the grids. So you, you, you have like many different way of walking this pattern on the, uh, on, on the surface. So is it also something to solve for? I mean, uh, different walkings uh, of this grid creates different forms or it's independent? If I um, sense. Yeah, so so I'll try to also uh, so so the wood right naturally has this grain, and um, it's usually I mean here you can see actually the the top one I, I don't know if you can see this that the top layer of this wood is going um, well I don't know if you see my mouse mouse but in this direction, and then the bottom one uh, is going uh, sort of in in this direction right uh, so with the 
with the grid, we can, if you had a square grid, then it's almost, it's basically isotropic, like there's no kind of bias in either direction. If you stretch the grid, as you see um, uh, here, the uh, where my mouse is, um, if you have it more, if you have these cells more horizontal, um, then uh, you are sort of creating like a grain as well. <laughs> so the idea is that you can really customize like the, the amount, you can make it square, um, you can make it very long. And maybe if we look at um, here, so um, it's also a bit hard to see, but you can see that these, the, the grid morphs where like it becomes um, quite long, like where the, the leg is and, and also becomes quite dense. Um, so that it can be stiff enough to support the the wood in the structure, um, and then you have like the the uh, like a lot more of this horizontal kind of three D printing pattern that is um, crossing the wood uh, bilayer so that it's able to allow it to bend without any um, uh, interference. Basically, I hope that it answers. Yeah, I, I think I got it this time. Thank you so much. So okay. you're re you're recreating the behavior of the grains with the aspect ratios with the different uh, rectangles. Yeah, yeah. So with wood, it's 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 hard to, you know, um, yeah, exactly. I mean, with the wood, it's 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 hard to control, right? Um, uh, so with the 3D printing, we can have a, a high degree of um, programmability. Um, and, uh, you know, if we don't, if, if we don't want it to even like have a direction, we can also make it like a square. If we want it to have um, a little bit of stretching, then we can introduce like different geometries. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. Any other questions? <laughs> Otherwise, I think we could move on so that we can have more time to uh, learn about origami. Yeah, okay, sounds great. Um, so I have a question for you guys. Um, you have a origami lecture and then a digital tutorial and then a physical tutorial. Do you think it's better to take 10 minutes right now a sort of a break and like 10 minutes for installing the the, or opening the grasshopper file, just making sure everything is set. So we can go to the tutorial right after the lecture or should I go ahead with the lecture now and we have a break later. So who wants to go with the lecture now and the, and the break and software installation later? You can virtually raise your hand. So lecture now. Break later or break now, lecture later. The lecture, please. I think we can go with the lecture now. Okay. Okay, so yeah, everybody agrees. Okay, awesome. <clears throat> so then give me just one second. Okay. Do you see my screen? Yep. Okay, so I am going to talk to you about self-shaping origami. So this is, of course, this is continuing on what we talked about yesterday with um, self-shaping paper and self-shaping origami. So. Today, we're going to focus more on the origami, which is the art of paper folding. So um, it comes from the words ori and kami from Japanese, which is folding the paper. And um, it, it, it is the art and a craftsmanship of turning a paper into a spatial uh, structure or a sculpture only by folding. So this is just the origami. 
And of course, you all know what it is, otherwise you would not have signed up for this workshop. But uh, just to look at some examples before we, we go into um, how origami went beyond the paper. Uh, you also probably know this, but um, recently origami has become uh, an important topic of research and development in uh, engineering and robotics and science, and it has um, various really cool applications. And you can take a look at some of them now. Uh, for example, in aerospace engineering, because origami has this capacity to go from something very, very much packed folded and packed into something deployed, which turns into a large structure. This makes it really interesting for, for uh, aerospace engineering because anything that needs to travel into space needs to be compact. And then in the space, it needs to like open up, for example, to protect, um, to, like, to protect the people and, and the station from, from radiation. And this is exactly what the structure that we're seeing in this image uh, is doing. Origami is also um, a very hot topic of research in biomedical engineering because of the exact same concept that it can be folded and very much packed in size and then it can be inserted into the body either with some pills that you can swallow or um, another application using the surgical tools that when they insert the body, they are small, and then they can deploy, they open up, they become a, like a gripper or something uh, that does some uh, medical job in the body. In robotics, it's also um, very much a favorite method to create different kinetics for robotic parts, either for the whole body of the robot, as you see here, or for special parts like the wheels or, um, any kind of any kind of uh, like hinged mechanisms um, based on origami folding is pretty um, popular in that field. And of course, for us, architecture, um, origami has been used in kinetic architecture. For example, the tower you see on the left hand side as um, these kinetic facade modules that cover space, and they can open and close. So again, this idea of going from flat to folded, open to close, compact to deployed, or people even use it as in its like solid and rigid form, just because it's, it's beautiful. And, um, they, the patterns have been used in creating pavilions or um, architecture in general. So this was an overview of or like a, just a quick introduction into origami from paper to this application in science and engineering. But um, in many of these, we talked about this like kinetic behavior of the origami. So then of course, self-folding origami becomes, becomes an interesting uh, topic to explore, right? If, if an origami structure can on its own, fold and unfold. And this is one of the uh, one of the papers from from the group at the MIT and Harvard that worked on self folding origami. Okay, so let's take a look um, here on the right hand side. You see these origami structures. Um, on the left, you see them in flat, and on the right, you see them folded. But the cool thing is that they self-fold. And the way that this is achieved is exactly by similar mechanisms that we looked at yesterday with paper plastic bilayer. So the diagram you see on the left-hand side, that blue part is the bilayer. So they, in this paper, they have built their bilayers with heat responsive plastic. So these are like shrinking or some, some plastics that when they get heated up, they shrink a lot. So they have that layer of plastic combined with layers of uh, cardboard and together they create a bilayer. And this bilayer is what makes these joints, uh, make, make the hinges foldable, self-foldable. 
the same concept have been used in, in a newer paper that they built this tiny centimeter long origami robots that are able to self-fold. So the self-folding happens through the same um, bilayer bending mechanism on the joints. And then they also have a locomotion for, for these tiny robots based on magnets and magnetic field. But um, this part is what is more relevant to, to our workshop at the moment. And also different methods, for example, of how to control the, the folds sequentially. This was the topic of this paper. Um, they used heat responsive material and they put, they, they put light with different colors on it. And they had hinges with different colors. And basically what happens is that uh, by varying this color light, different hinges get heated up more and they fold first. But again, for us, the most relevant part is just looking of how the self-folding is happening. So they have some uh, faces. If you see my mouse, hopefully. Um, they have these faces that they don't change shape. And they have hinge zones that bend. And by bending these hinges, the faces come together and the origami basically folds itself. And of course, let's not forget about the high robot or the similar, uh, similar concepts uh, of self-folding and self-shaping using hyperscopic materials. You'll see on the right-hand side, exact same uh, bilayer structure that we have, which uh, reacts to the vapor or uh, water spraying and some locomotive robots. And I will end with some like, beautiful work from uh, Christophe Gouberan, which created this amazing uh, self-folding origami structures by only um, using water and paper. And, OK. So in, in these examples, what we looked at were um, normal origami structures, origamis that have flat uh, faces, that are connected to each other with straight uh, fold lines or creases. So that is the kind of origami we all know. And um, the way they, the self-folding is, um, is initiated uh, is by putting bilayer, little bilayers on the hinge zones. We saw that in almost all of these examples, right? Um, but what we're going to, uh, what I'm going to talk to you about now is self-shaping curved folding, which is another type of origami, and it, it can have another type of um, actuation for self-shaping. Okay, so first, what exactly is curved crease origami or curved folding? Well, it is similar to normal origami, but instead of having uh, straight fold lines or straight creases, we have curved creases. So you see here that like all the fold lines are, are curved in 2D. And what happens is that when these structures get folded on the crease line, you see that the faces, uh, the faces of the origami are no longer flat. The face is also bent. So this actually makes these kind of structures really, really, really beautiful. They, like David Hoffman or Eric Domain or um, people who worked on um, origami really take advantage of this beauty that comes from combining um, bending on the faces and folding on the crease lines. So what we have uh, developed in this concept of self-shaping curved folding is that let's take advantage of this property that in curved folding, the faces are bent. And let's put the bilayer on the faces instead of on the hinges. So here, as you see in this structure, the hinges are very, very thin. And when it folds, the hinges are completely sharp. And that is something great that we like about it. At the same time, you see this uh, familiar uh, wood 3D printing pattern on the faces. Basically, upon changes in the moisture, our faces bend. 
and this bending on the faces will result in folding on the fringes. So one, one reason that we love this kind of structure is that it provides motion amplification. Imagine these two structures in your life and on the, on the right and left, they think that there are some um, elements on a facade or on a variable, and you want them to open and close. You see that the structure with the curve folding geometry is able to create much more opening because of the ability to have these sharp fold lines and because of this uh, geometric principle that translates bending to folding. So the two structures on the right and the left, they were made with the same material, but you see one on the right hand side, it is a basic bilayer. And just by bending, it can create 27% opening, but the curve folding run around 70%. So when we're working with the paper, we don't really see this issue because paper changes shape a lot. But when we work with the wood or with the 3D printing, when we want to make elements that are like thicker or stronger, then the amount of shape changes in force. Okay, so this was a side note. Let's go back to, to the soft shape in curved folding. So uh, when we have this kind of principle, the principle of actuating faces, uh, which will result in folding the hinges, well, we can just um, have it on more complex patterns. For example, the pattern that you see, the face pattern that you see here, um, here you see how it is soft folding. So this also another side, side point in here is that one reason that we really like this kind of uh, self folding in origami tessellations is that the material is doing the job itself, right? Everything is, it is folding itself and it's doing it perfectly. And doing this by hand or by a robot, that would be an extremely difficult job, but with, um, with the sub concepts of self shaping and self assembly, we can we can let material do its job. Here is another uh, example of this kind of uh, careful encapsulation, and it's self shaping um, as it is drying. Okay, so because in this workshop we might want to work with soft shaping for folding, I will elaborate a bit more on, on the principles of how this is working. And then in some slides, I will show you how we can make um, self shaping curve folding with paper. So actually, maybe I can pause really quickly, see if you have any questions by now. If you do, just unmute yourself and ask. If you don't, I will continue. Okay, then I will continue. Okay, so I briefly explained that the way the mechanism work is by, um, by bending, bending the faces, which results in folding of the hinges. But so, the, so what, we, what we do to create the standing in the faces is to create bilayers in there. So there are some geometric rules that we will need to follow in order for this, this whole mechanism to work properly, properly. And they are four rules. So these four rules I'm going to uh, describe. The first rule is that the two faces on the two sides of a curved crease need to bend in the opposite concave or convex directions. So as you see on, the, <clears throat> on this image on the right-hand side, you see one face is bending upwards and or like um, convex, and one face is bending downwards or concave. And this is, this is the main, um, the main like force that, that creates this like folding on the hinges. And how do we go? How do we switch a concave or convex? Well, we looked at that yesterday. 
that is by changing the placement of the active and the passive layer, or in our case, uh, changing the placement of the paper and the passive. Now, rule number two is that the bending orientation should be parallel to the curved creases. So um, this means that when you have two faces, if you look at my hands, they need to bend in the direction parallel to the curved crease so that they kind of buckle and fold. Otherwise, they go like this kind of S curve or S structures that we looked at yesterday, that like no folding will happen um, on the hinge. And another way to look at this, to like this kind of, uh, the bending direction on the faces is to look at the, the surface ruling lines, uh, the gray, the gray um, lines that we see in these images. Okay, so um, if you know the ruled surfaces, these are, um, well, in geometric term, it's, uh, it's, these are the surfaces that, um, that can be described as a set of points that are, uh, sorry, set of surfaces that are made by, by moving a straight line in the space. So for example, in a cylinder, you have a straight line and if you move it along the circle, you will have a cylinder. Or in a cone, if you have the line like one side on, the, on top of like, uh, on the apex and one side on the circle, and if you move it around the circle, you will have a conical surface. So all of our bending surfaces, all of the surfaces that we create with bilayers are root surfaces. And in the case of paper, because we have a one directional fiber direction, these are uh, cylindrical root surfaces. And these the surface rulings are basically the lines that are staying straight in, um, on a surface. So if you look at the this like physical sample here, you see that these lines, the gray, li the gray lines that you see on the left-hand side, they will stay constant, they will stay straight um, along the two faces. So this will be another way, another way to describe this like bending direction uh, because the bending direction is perpendicular to, to the surface rulings in, um, in, the sur in the cylindrical surface. And uh, okay, so here's just, um, if you might have, or like think of the question of how do we exactly know these surface rulings? And the thing is that with, with curve folding with the paper, you can actually twist the paper easily. So the su surface ruling can change uh, as you see on the on this, like, two right-hand side columns. But, when we use bilayer mechanism or bilayer bending, we always create cylindrical surfaces. So our surface rulings are always perpendicular to each other. And the way that we need to place them is um, bending direction parallel to the curve piece or surface ruling um, perpendicular to the curve piece in order to be able to have a fold. And here are just some more um, um, complex examples of, of uh, surface rulings in, uh, in curved folded structures. So these are from this paper, uh, paper uh, curved folding. And you see that um, on the left-hand side here, we have these uh, parallel surface rulings, cylindrical surface. This is what we can easily get with the paper. But what we see on the right-hand side are kind of surface rulings that are um, not necessarily parallel. And what happens here is that the curved folds are kind of like twisting in the space, which is like absolutely beautiful, uh, but uh, much harder to achieve with paper or almost impossible to achieve with paper. Kind of possible with 3D printing, but to some extent. All right, so then the first and the second rule was about bending direction and bending orientation on the faces, right? The third rule is about having an inflection point on the crease line. So uh, here you see um, that we have a, have a crease in 2D. We have a crease line that is kind of an S shape that is changes its curvature direction. And what this rule describes is that if we have this case, the faces um, 
need to change sign in the bending direction. So this is best shown, sorry, on, on the physical model here, that here we have a con concave and then a convex um, as, as we have this like inflection point on the cruise line. And now uh, the last rule, the final rule, uh, describes the relationship between um, mountain and valley faults and um, the curvature, um, decreased curvature direction. So basically, this rule is saying, let's, let's take a look at this graph A, is that a curved crease falls as a mountain if the rule segment on the convex side of the crease bends upwards and the rule segment on the concave sound side bends downwards. So uh, what we have here is our crease. On the right-hand side, it's the convex side of the crease. And on the convex side, we also have a convex bending. This results in a mountain. And what you see in C and D is that if we switch or if we mirror the crease, the curved creases, that we change um, the convex or concave side of the curved crease, then we can switch between mountain folds and valley folds. Okay, guys, I'm sorry if the, this was uh, confusing. This will be much easier if, when you're actually like physically making these or um, drawing them in Rhino and Grasshopper, but these were the geometrical rules that we needed to go through. And I also included them in some slides uh, that you can download from the Google Drive. And just one last point is that there is also a relationship between the crease curvature and the folding angle. And in the case of um, our self-shaping method, where uh, we induce bending on the faces, we can basically control this fold angle by changing the crease curvature. So you see, for example, if you have um, on the very right-hand side, on the right side image, um, in the case of having too small radius in the crease line, the folding angle is um, very much smaller rather than like having um, a crease curvature with a larger radius. For example, in R called 75 millimeter, 100 millimeter. So um, the fold angle becomes more tight if the radius is larger. Okay, so after looking at these, I think we can just uh, take a look at how we can make these with paper. So uh, first I will show a quick example of straight case origami, then one of the curved trees, and then we can start building that. Okay, so for the case of straight case origami. The method that I want to, um, I want to introduce to you, and I think this, is, this one works nicely, is to do something like this. So you all remember this paper and plastic bilayer that creates bending. If we block some of the areas uh, of this bilayer, and leave only some part open. What happens is that in the parts that we have this three layer, which is plastic, paper, plastic, we don't have any bending. Only on the part that we have proper bilayer structure, we will have a bending. So what this structure, if you build this with paper and plastic, what you will see is that you will have bending here and some uh, flat, faces on, on the two sides. And that is kind of what we're looking for. Um, so here I made this basic example with paper and plastic. You see side two is the back side of it, where it's completely um, filled with tape. On the top side, uh, we have two origami faces that are uh, covered with tape. And this middle area, which is our fold line or our hinge line, and this is where we have bending. And I put this structure uh, and I splash water on it, and this is how it formed.
actually this works uh, pretty nicely and I think we're going to try it together later but the fact that we put tape on two sides of the paper on the faces really helps with increasing the stiffness and avoiding water to go through that area and make it fluffy so the only only soft part we have are on the hinges that are softening them, shaping themselves. And with the similar concepts that we showed yesterday, if we want to have mountain and valley creases, we can switch the placement of the bilayer. So if this structure gave us only uh, uh, a mountain fold, because here we have the paper and here we have the plastic and paper expands. So, um, what you will see here, you will have a mountain fold here, and then a valley fold here, and then a mountain fold here. So you kind of need to carefully place the tape on the two sides of the paper. Um, I think similar to what most of you did uh, in, since yesterday. So this was the case of straight crease origami. Now let's go to the case of curved crease origami. So, for this one, um, so for the straight crease, we had the bilayer on the hinges, right? But in the curved crease origami, you will have bilayer on the faces. And as we remember from the geometric rules, uh, on the two sides of the face, we need the bilayer to be uh, in the opposite direction. Okay, so let's first look at the structure and make the paper. I think it looks, it works well. And it falls even more than our 3D printed structures because paper is very high risk problem. Okay, so this was to show you that it works. Um, how do we exactly do that? What is the process to go, with, go, go about it? So first um, is to design a pattern. So, the pattern, the design pattern is a simple uh, one fold and two faces, what you see uh, in my right now page. But uh, the other thing you see is that I also mirrored it. And I did that because when I want to transfer it on the paper, I need to flip the paper. This is what you see here. So I got a paper, um, pay attention to the bending direction, bending direction parallel to the crease line. So I put the paper with the, with the correct fiber direction and I marked it. I draw the crease lines and the corners on one side. Then I flip the paper and because flipping the paper means it is mirrored, I also needed to mirror my pattern and then mark it on the other side of the paper. So this is, uh, this is after, after we, transfer the pattern on a paper, I put the text to create the bilayers. So uh, on one side, the bilayer on top of the paper and the other face on the bottom to have different um, bending directions. In the next step, I just cut, cut away the excess tape. Um, so from both from the sides and also very like carefully cut it from the hinge line, you need to be, uh, crease line, sorry, you need to be careful not to cut through the paper, um, but just the plastic and then remove the additional plastic. And then there is a final step that is very important. And this step includes weakening the hinges. The thing is, you saw in the 3D printed structures that our hinges were really, really soft. We print them with a very soft material and we print only some lines we need to kind of have the same thing with the paper. Our hinge needs to be um, very soft and it, have, it needs to have a lower stiffness so that it can fold. Otherwise, you can try it without like weakening the hinges, only if you have the two bilayers on the side, um, the fold line will not be defined and it cannot really fold. So this would be, after doing that, and this is actually a very tricky part, if you do it too much, you will cut through the paper. 
if you to, do it too little, um, it will not be able to fold. But after you make it, it will hopefully fold nicely as we saw in this small video here. So let's watch this and then I will start sharing the screen. Okay, so questions. Super interesting lectures, both, both lectures. I have some questions concerning the 3D printing prototypes. They are responsive to moisture, correct? And yes. um, the both layers, the active and the passive layers are filament. They are both 3D printed. Yeah, the active layer we printed with wood filled filament mm -hmm. uh, and the passive layer with normal plastic. Oh. And then the hinge layer with the flexible plastic, flexible filament. Super nice. <laughs> Congratulations. Thanks. Yeah, Yassi, thank you for, for the amazing lecture. Could you also show again uh, how, how with the paper and the tape you, you made it? I got the part about weakening the curve folds, but I'm not sure uh, the part about removing the tape. Oh, yeah. Well, is it I actually possible? Because when I stick the paper, stick the tape to the paper, it, it, I, I wouldn't be able to yeah, peel yeah. it off. Okay, uh, maybe one thing that I didn't mention is that I use thicker paper uh, okay. for the curve folds. So you can't, really, you can't really do it with a very thin paper. Um, you need thicker paper so that you have more stiffness on the faces and then just like weekend hinges. Yeah, so uh, you, you only put the tape on the one like concave side of the... Uh, Concave exactly, side. Exactly, okay. exactly. Because the paper swells, expands, it should uh -huh. come up. So yeah. All right. I mean, I can just, I have a bunch of these. I can put water. We will have, we will have a physical tutorial. Uh, right. So that the tutorials are going to be just the rest of today, both physical and digital, and we can make them together. But just, also show you your life. Yeah. Kind of life. Well, that's fascinating to watch because curve folds are really, really difficult to fold with the hand. <laughs> yeah. You know much better than anybody, I think. But yeah. Yeah, curve folds are difficult, um, especially when you get to the tessellations and if you have more fold lines like this would be easy, but. Okay, so we, are, we, are, we will get to these uh, shortly. Uh, I'm just wondering if you put the tape on the elliptical side or not. Uh, on the top or the bottom of the... Uh, in this one, uh -huh. in this, sorry, these were two different designs, right? Um, this one is a design with a single curve. This one is the one I showed in the video. And yes, there is tape on, on the two flaps and also in the middle side. But um, here is concave, convex, concave. Right, so that I have these two oh, fold lines. So here is like, on this side here is tape, paper, tape. On the other side, paper, tape. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, I have a question about uh, the wood uh, filament. Uh, is it something customized or is it available and we can use it? 
I don't need, I don't, I don't know. Uh, so it is definitely something you can buy. Uh -huh. Because it is our research at the Institute, we customize it because um, we need to have like a better performance or whatever. But a lot of the samples that you saw, for example, curve folding samples, they are made with commercial filaments. Um, so there are different kind of wood fin filaments uh, that you can buy. We have found a guy in Germany who produces filaments that change shape a lot. So if you want, we can send you the link from that guy, but uh, you can buy them and you can test them to see if they change it a lot or not. It depends on how much wood content it has and also the properties of the plastic. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay. All right, so seems like we are okay for now. So just so you know, I put these slides, um, the parts about paper, paper origami and the principles, I put them uh, in, the, in our folder in day two, in case you just want to have them open. And the other things you can find in day two are the literature and, and the example files. And this example files is what we're going to need uh, after our break. So let me send the link here again in case you don't have it. Um, I, send it I send it in the chat. So uh, we can go on a break for 10 minutes. And in this time, it would be great if you can uh, if you can open the Rhino Grasshopper file on your computers. So it it has less uh, it it requires much less plugins that the file we gave you yesterday. The things it needs is Kangaroo Two and Weaverbird, and those two I also made a subfolder plugins. I put the Kangaroo Two there and Weaverbird. Um, I put a link for that. So just go to that link, you need to download it and install it. It is not uh, with the method of copy and pasting uh, in this class of their writers folder. So it's just a different installation. But I put those in the plugins folder. So I hope that we can all, uh, we can all get that, um, have that on our computers. And Emily, um, I will go to take a two minute break and I will come back and we can talk. And I think, um, so um, yeah, I, I, in any case, not just Emily, everybody, I will come back in three minutes and we can go through the questions for installing. And Emily, I'll talk to you about yesterday's lecture. It's great to have you here today. And let's try to quickly catch up some of the parts of yesterday. Sure, no problem. Thank you. Um, yeah, okay. Okay, then um, we will officially start in 10 minutes. If you have the file installed and everything, go enjoy your 10 minutes. If not, I'll be back here in two, three minutes and we can publish um, it. I guess I could also stay for the first three minutes um, and then Yasi comes back <laughs> if anyone has questions right now and then I'll, I'll like take my break uh, in three minutes. If anyone has questions or with installations or anything like that, um, I'll just be here for a couple more minutes. I have a quick question. Uh, do we have to install the Weaverbird plugin if we have Rhino 7? Oh, for I think you still have to. I don't. Okay. I'm not. I don't think it comes with a uh, Rhino Seven. Well, let me double check, but I, I don't think so. I, I can still install it. Anyways, if if you can't open the file, then that means um, you would have to install it. But I, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I think you have to download it 
Okay. Thank you. Hi, Tiffany. I didn't get the intros yesterday. Are you in a PhD program or are you it, like, what, what's your yeah, background? Um, we are both, uh, Yassi and I are both um, PhD okay. students in the okay. uh, awesome. ICD. Very cool. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hi. Sorry for my uh, mix up there, but I think I can catch up maybe. <laughs> no problem. Yeah, I, I hope so. I really hope so because Epic. You don't want to waste your time if you can't catch up, but I hope we can, we can make it. Yeah. Uh, it's great to have you here. So Yeah, thank you. Yes, we, you're, you're actually a professor at the university, right? That's right. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah, I, I did a project. Um, the curb folding is reminding me. I For a little while, I taught at the American University of Sharjah in UAE. And um, we had uh, we did a, a design build where obviously not self-folded, but it was curve folding in like stainless steel, like a big wall. Um, so yeah, I was well, taken back to that. Yeah, <laughs> with the curve folding. Yeah, 
yeah, then then this might be interesting because oh, absolutely, yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, super super cool. That you can do it with paper too. Yeah, okay. All your recent paper actually um, at AEG, right? You did you have a paper? Oh, I had a I had a paper at AEG. Yeah, you, you're at AEG. Oh, okay, yeah, awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah. Deal, oh, right? okay. Yes. Uh huh. So cool. Yeah, that was a really uh, fun conference. It was a lot of it was in the middle of the night for me, uh, so I, uh, was, <laughs> I missed some of the presentations because of that, but. Um, yeah, I wish we could have gone in person for that one, but it was it was a great. Where group of, are you after papers? I'm in Arkansas. Arkansas, okay. Yeah, University of Arkansas right now. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so Emily, I think the only the important thing that I wanted to tell you was about this paper plastic bilayers. This is the main thing that we um, that we worked on yesterday. So the thing is that we, we have some normal paper, either with like higher thickness or lower thickness paper. And um, the paper, because of the cellulose content of it, is hygroscopic. So it expands when you splash it with water. But normal paper, when you splash with water, nothing happens, it just works. Um, what we do is that we combine this with a layer of tape. Uh, normal scotch tape or something, and this creates the bilayer structures. But the thing to, to notice here is that there is a directionality in the paper based on the direction of cellulose fibers. And that is something that you need to detect because that defines the bending direction in, in, your, in your bilayers. So if you look at it, actually in the thinner papers, you can kind of see this fiber directionality. If it's too, too difficult to see it, what, what we can do is that, or the, or the way I do it is um, like I like make three bilayers. Like, uh, I'm, I'm just going to show you in a moment. Horizontal. So, so on a piece of paper, I first draw this so I know which direction mm -hmm. I'm going in. And then I put the tape on each of these to kind of make three bilayers with in different directions. Oh, okay. And whichever bilayer um, bends uh, nicely. That, that gives me now what is the direction of my paper. And then I kind of mark that on the paper. So here you see now I put this pieces of tape. And what I'm going to do next is that I'm going to just cut it. Can do this? This would be better for now. Um, usually in most of the papers, the orientation is either vertical or horizontal. And that's just because, uh, because of the way that the paper is manufactured. Um, but what I will do at this moment is I am cutting the two bilayer samples of my vertical and horizontal. So here you see my two bilayers. And then, so on these samples, I have tape on one side and the paper on the other side. And what I'm going to do next is I am going to splash some water on it. Okay, I think we can see that one of them is like, bending nicely, the other one kind of wants to bend in the opposite direction uh, or, in, or in the like, transverse. So here, so here now for, for this one, which was my vertical, I have, I have a nice bending. This one is kind of wants to bend the, uh, the, the other way. So this way, now I know that the directionality of my paper was vertical, so I will just mark it. And then this will help me um, when I'm uh, when I want to place place my design. So I think we saw that okay. in Kirigami things that the guys showed at the beginning. Yeah. 
This was the direction we talked about, talked about in the origami. So this is kind of the key information okay. you have for following. Perfect. I will, I'll test it out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to start while you're talking, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that's good. Too. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And please, please feel free to ask questions. Um, sure, okay. If you're not, I mean, of course, it would be difficult to follow, so just ask. Yeah, and thank that you. Be the best great. way to go for it. Okay, so everybody else, how is it going with installing um, and opening the file? For me, it worked well. Okay, perfect. I don't know if everybody's back. So for the rest of the people, if you have a problem, you can share your screen so we can see what component is missing or what is the problem and we try to solve it. Tiffany, do you think we should start with the physical prototyping or the digital? I'm already, <laughs> I'm already doing mine. <laughs> physical. I'm so yeah. excited. <laughs> No, but that's, um, I think it would be good to do the digital just so we understand a little bit about the curvature of the creases before we get started on the physical. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm getting a warning about mesh edit components. I mean, I have Weaverbird installed. Hey, um, I don't know, maybe this is about transitioning from six to seven? Um, I think we, are we use is the file, uh, Yassi, did you use Rhino 7 to make your file? No, I'm using Rhino 6. Okay. And Emily, you're using Rhino 7? Right. Ah, okay. I can open it in six. Yeah, that might be the easiest thing to okay, do. I'll try that. Farsi is coming. Bacha, to nestin file of basing, to nestin file of Boston. I can't do this, but I'm going to be in the screen. I'm going to share the screen. I'm going to share the screen. I'm going to share We turn on to chat and search for certain. I get you the Nagin Alon, I think when I'm Kihana, I did the violation. Okay. شیرین تو تونستی فایلو بریزی؟ یه سوالی هم داشتم این شما وقتی که کار آخری که خودتون انجام دادید فیزیکاله اینو شما از سلایه رو چسب زدید بر اساس همون چیزی که تو لکچر بود یعنی از بیرون و پشت و فقط هینجش و خ... یعنی اونو از یه طرف توی اوریگامیه همینی که الان نشون دادید اینجوری خم شد آره بله 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 
دقیقا این بودش so um, here I'm just showing the sample of the scree, uh, straight crease origami and the question was where exactly do we have the tape and you see on this side it's all tape on the other side it's tape only on the hinge yeah. it is tape and then it's tape again Thanks. so I, I, yeah I will I can splash water on it now again. It's kind of. Yeah. So the sides that are, yeah, like tape on both sides, they're a bit more stiff. They don't get wet. So this is it's kind of perfect. این شکل به دیگه این کامل تیپ اینجا تیپ تیپ کپس وقتی که داشتی توی راین رو نشون میدادید که این دوتا رو به حالت میرور بودش و گفتیم فولد کنیم برای این بود که میخواستیم یه کاغذ رو دو طرفش رو ترسیم کنیم درسته؟ دقیقا البته ببینید اون چیزی که نشون دادن این کرفت فولدینگه بود میدونم آره بره. آره ولی اون رو بس بس این میرور کردم که هر دو طرفش باشه ولی اونم دوباره هر دو طرفش رو کامل این چسب رو زدید فقط نه نه توی این هینج فقط یه طرف هینج فقط یه خط توی این این فیس اینجا پلاستیک داره این یکی فیس مکوزش داره برعکس داره so this was just the, the difference between straight crease and the curved crease as you see in the curved crease Our crease is only a line. If this is only a line that we scratch it, it cut it to make it soft. But in the straight crease, our hinge is, is a surface that needs to bend. This is, this is what we mentioned, that in straight crease, we actuate or we do the self-folding by having bilayer on the hinges. But in the curved crease, we do that by having bilayer on the faces. This is because of the special geometry that curve folding is giving us. Because in the straight crease, the faces are flat. But in the curved crease, the faces bend. This is what we can use. Mm. Okay, so let's go to, let's go to the tutorials. And um, let's first go quickly to the digital workflow. And then we go to the physical and then we can just like work together. If you want to work more on the, on the digital, you can do that. Or if you want to prototype physically, we can also do that. So I will share this screen here right now. So this is the file that I, uh, oh. You see my screen now? Yeah, it was good. Yeah. I need to move again. Sorry. Okay. Okay, okay. So this is a file that you have. And what you see in this file is just some examples of Um, of the crease patterns that I put and some instructions how you can uh, input these into the grasshopper cup. So let's take a quick look at this grasshopper. Um, I don't know if you got the chance to visit the, the YouTube video I sent you yesterday. That YouTube video describes how this is built and it is by that amazing guy uh, I don't remember his name. 
Um, but anyways, if you have watched that, that would be helpful. If not, I will just go through it really quickly. So we have some sections here. The first section is about making the mesh. The, the second section is getting extracting some lines from the mesh for our later simulation step. And then here we have the kangaroo solver, which is what we also saw yesterday, which is uh, solving this constraint problem based on some goals that we defined. And the main goals that we define in this workflow are hinges. So this is a little bit of of the black box about this um, about this workflow that we don't exactly know how this hinge component works or how the hinge points are working. We, we do know that based on the description that we didn't build it ourselves, but I think this is good. This is still usable because it's very easy to use, but um, basically the hinge component creates a hinge between two triangular mesh faces on the two sides of it. And the hinge point component just gives the right points to this like to this hinge goal so that it can create this like uh, two triangles that that rotate on on a hinge line. So the thing that we do here is that we have a mesh. Let me actually um, let me put it on a very simple case. So we have a mesh, and this mesh goes. This mesh goes into this hinge points and the hinge components, and we select some of them, um, some of them to create our uh, mountain and valley poles. So if we go and then and then these are these are the main goals that we have. We give it to the to the solver, and then we uh, run the simulation. If you are wondering why this thing is moving or not, or how the movement is controlled, we can go to this slider. I wrote here, start the solver with slider to zero and sl slowly increase the value. So I put it now to zero. I go restart. So it starts in the flat. And then if I increase this, Fold. Okay, let's start with the simpler, um, simpler case first, which is our straight crease origami. Let's go to this basic, basic one that we have. Um, the way you use this workflow is that here at the beginning, you need to give it an input of all the curves. So all the curves are here are actually just these outlines and the mountain and valley folds. So I select all of them and I set multiple curves. And this gives me a mesh. So here is this beaver bird component that turns a set of lines into a mesh. So after I have my mesh, then the hinges will be defined and actually this component put hinges all over the place. In all, all the mesh lines, uh, it wants to create a hinge. What we do here is that we select only those hinges that are placed on our mountain folds or on our valley folds. So for this, we will need to have two other inputs, curved valleys and curved mountains. Um, I pick, I take all the blue lines and I give them to my curved valleys. And then I take all the red lines and I give them to my curved mountains. And what is happening here is basically it will only select of all the hinges that it created based on the mesh it only selects those hinges that are um, that are um, at the same place as our mountain folds or valley folds. So these will be one set, this will be the other set, mountain and valley, and they go to our to our solver as our goal. 
So I have set up now, I have given it a new mesh now. I restart it. And I put this on true. And then I go to my slider and slowly move the slider. And here you can see this component folding. So if you want to think of it a bit more conceptually, what we are doing in this workflow is that at the beginning, we are creating some mesh faces that each mesh face is corresponding to one face of our origami. And these mesh faces are staying the same. What is changing is the hinges that we define between the mesh faces. So basically we have, we have a quad mesh here. The mesh face remains straight, remains flat. On, on the edges that the meshes are connected to each other, they can hinge. And this is, this is the main principle of uh, rigid folding in the origami, origami types such as uh, Nira Ori, such as the simple case. Um, a, lot of, a lot of origami patterns that are familiar to us that are also used for kinetic, kinetic structures and stuff, they are all uh, this type of rigid origami. And, they are very well represented with quad meshes and the hinges defined between, uh, between the mesh faces. A bit more complex example is our Miura Ori pattern that we have here. So you can, again, select all the lines, go to the beginning of, um, of the grasshopper file here, input all curves, and you set multiple curves here. And then the second step, the second set of inputs, you need to input the mounting curves and the valley curves here. So here I have curved valleys. Again, I select all the blue curves. Um, I, have, uh, I have grouped them, if you have the same file. Set multiple curves here, doing the same for curved mountains. Now it should be set up. Oh, um, I didn't put the slider back. Yes. And this is how you can see it fold and unfold. Okay, so this was this was our case for uh, straight crease origami. Um, yeah. So I think, I mean, you, you, you now have this file and you see that what, what I input is very, very simple, right? There are just some curves. And what I suggest you to do uh, both today and also probably in the rest of this workshop is that you will try to uh, draw your own crease patterns. If you might face some problems, some like silly-ish problems. For example, if, if the curves are, uh, connected to each other if they're not exploded and mesh might not be made properly. So these will be the things that will need some debugging and we can go, the, go through them together. So especially when you start your project uh, by the end of today, or sorry, by tomorrow and you will work on your individual cases, we can just troubleshoot. But at this moment, it would be great if you can like play with these and try to draw your own cases. Uh, these patterns. Do you have any questions until now? Maybe just to add that um, I, I guess later um, in the next part we will do some physical prototyping, but I think this is really useful for kind of understanding like what the curvature, like the, uh, the curved crease does. Um, before, I mean, I would do them um, in conjunction, but once you start to design your pieces, um, they become a lot more, I mean, it takes it takes effort to make them, right? The paper construction. So it's, it's also a very useful tool to kind of um, test out ideas uh, before you go through the process. Yeah, very good point. 
Yeah, thanks, Stephen, for working with that. Okay, okay, so after these, which were our uh, rigid foldable straight piece origami examples, let's let's take a look at these curved crease origamis. Okay, so we are we are using a trick here. The fact that we are using the same workflow that we use for straight crease, but we are applying it to curved crease, is showing that trick that we are making. What we are doing here is that we are discretizing a curved folded pattern into small pieces, and we are assuming that, it, that each of these pieces uh, are a part, are a rigid foldable origami patch, meaning that the faces are remaining straight and the crease is a, uh, is a straight line. So, oh, it's too much. Okay, that, so as you see here, um, you see this like uh, a crease pattern with a curveful line. But if you zoom in on it, you would see that this curve is actually not a real curve. I have made it, this is, this is just a group of curves uh, of straight lines that are connected to each other. So this is of, of our curve crease. The way we discretize this is important because if you discretize it randomly, it will not work. You need to discretize it into the sections that you can assume these sections are remaining flat and remaining straight. And the way to go for it is to look at the surface rulings, what we talked in our lecture. So if here I have oriented, uh, oriented these lines on the surface rulings, and in this way, I am, I am sure that all of these lines are remaining straight. So basically in one of these sections, I have straight line here, straight line here, straight line here, and straight line here. So now this is a quad mesh that is remaining, remaining the same, remaining the flat. And the only thing that is changing is the, is the angle between two adjacent mace, mesh faces. So let me... Uh, start the simulation on this basic example here. That you see that as I move the slider, oh, come on. Oh, sorry, I didn't. I didn't input my curve. Uh, okay, my curve value set on curve. Oh no. Okay. <laughs> So I should not set one curve. You saw here what I did, so it set one curve and I clicked on one of these sections and of course this doesn't work. So I need to select the group of the curves I have and here put set multiple curves. So I still make these mistakes and you of course for sure will do too, but these are the tiny button things that it's talking about. Anyways, we start. Put it on true, and now it is falling. So uh, it takes like a few moments to solve it, and in those moments you see some of the faces getting like wobbly. But after it is done, uh, we can really see like uh, the faces as they remain flat and hinge as it falls. Um, let me just do test this. If you input the curve in the curve mounting, first I will create values here, and then I will set multiple curves. Go back to my simulation. Yeah, now it is. And now it is falling as an answer. So, so basically, the important thing to, to understand here is first how, how this discretization method is helping us simulate curve folding with a rigid folded origami method. And the second is that 
The way we discretize it is by using the rule, the surface rulings. So the discretization, the mesh construction should be based on the surface ruling lines. Let's take a look at this one. I mean, we can also uh, put this one. You see this clip. This one is my favorite because it's a really um, beautiful piece pattern. But I go there, select all of them, and set multiple things at the beginning. You see a mesh is constructed nicely. And then the last part, I select multiple clips here, and select multiple clips here. The restart, enable. Okay, this one is especially one of those patterns that you should, that you should uh, move the slider slowly. because it's really trying to solve constraints of this mesh. So bubbly, 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 until it gets to some equilibrium. So, um, so this was the basic. Yeah, basically, uh, I mean, I, I can try like redrawing one of this right now live if you want to see it or I think we don't have too much time for that. So maybe you guys can take a few minutes to work with it if you haven't done it by now. Um, and then we can go more individually from the person to person um, if you have any issues uh, with like drawing your own lines and trying your own design, okay? So that uh, I think that I think I'm pretty much done now. Questions? Um, Yasi, I have a question regarding the pattern you just tried, the circular one. Yeah. Um, so I tried, um, uh, I tried the same thing and it, it, the final result is more like a, a saddle curve. Mm -hmm. It's not, uh, I, I'm wondering why it is in the form that it is because the, uh, the mountain, the valley lines are even. So I, I'm not sure why it is a dip on like two sides and why it's like a mountain on the other two sides. I'm not sure if you get what I mean. Yeah, like the, why is the end result the way it is, even though the lines are like, they're even all along. Uh -huh. So why is there a saddle being formed yeah. out of this crease pattern? Yeah. Uh, why? So, so there is no change in the length of the paper itself, right? Mm -hmm. But when you're making the making a fold, you are basically shrinking, uh, shrinking the distances. So if you look, look at it from the top, you see that the circle, the, the circle on the side is trying to shrink, 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 because here is folding. And as you fold, the two, the, the, the rings are getting closer and closer together. So because this ring cannot really, the rings cannot actually shrink and expand, uh, which is the result of that folding, they need to go into the saddle shape so that they can keep their length or like they can, they can increase their length while the inner circle is keeping their, its length. So I think this is, sorry, if, I'm, um, if I describe it too bad, for some reason, I'm a little bit blanking at the moment, even though I shouldn't be. Um, 
but but the, but the shrinking is not from from the paper itself, but it is it is like the same here. By folding, you're shrinking this length, and by folding here, like like you're shrinking this length, this radius here. Yeah, no, that um, that does make sense. It so ideally, in principle, it means that the the, the crease lens, or I mean, the mountain or the valley lens, are trying to maintain the length, and that's why. It, uh, exactly. Shrinks in this fashion. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. So, like, it needs to maintain this length, this length, but somehow it needs to shrink in this like radial, radial direction because you have this mountain and valley fold, and that is the only way to do that. Right. Thank it needs you. to go into that side of shape. Thanks. Okay. Any more questions? I actually have one more question um, yeah. with respect to uh, the the same the, uh, the same geometry. I think since the lines, uh, I don't know if, it, if my question makes sense. But can a similar behavior be mimicked in um, a slice of wood? Like if you cut through a trunk of wood, um, cut yeah, cut across like a section of wood. It has annual rings, right? Like that's how a tree trunk becomes thicker. Like from the center, it, it grows radially. Mm -hmm. So can can the natural pattern of wood be used to mimic behavior similar to this, without like the use of um, uh, another material to define its pattern? Like this is a very interesting wood, question. Um, so it can't be as because it doesn't have any like hinge lines or fold lines uh, a slice of wood would not make uh, this sort of curved folding for you but and just thinking of that slice of wood and the way that it is expanding and shrinking in the direction uh, in the direction of um, of the fibers I would think that that should have a similar effect, probably with a much, much, much less magnitude. Um, because you know, like in a slice of wood or the natural wood material only expands and shrinks 5% or 6% in its length or in its volume, right? So that is, that is not too much, too much of a length change that can that give you this, um, uh, this like basically monolayer um, mono layer shape changing. When we make it into bilayer, we, we give it motion amplification, but the expansion and shrinkage on its own, it is not too much. Mm -hmm. I can show you like some, or I can send you some examples of the papers uh, that use other materials that have much more expansion and shrinkage than wood, for example, hydrogel, and there, they exactly do this thing that they arrange the material radially, and uh, it come it suddenly pops up or goes into a saddle shape, only as a mono layer. So I can send you send you some examples of that. Later. Sure, thank you. Any more questions? Okay. Okay. So you can you can continue like you can keep playing with this um, today and the rest of the day. And if you found some bugs, um, if you can't like if your mesh is not created nicely, just uh, write to me or tell me so that we can troubleshoot. But some things that come to my head is that these mountain and valley folds are not a single curve. They are actually a group of a bunch of lines. So if I ungroup this, you see that there are single single curves. And they also should not be joined. So they should be exploded segments of the lines. Uh, so this is one thing we need. And also uh, like the boundaries and stuff, they also should be um, segmented sections rather than having one rectangle. So these are actually at least the problems that I faced when, because these just go into how this like weaver bird uh, mesh generation um, 
component breaks and also about here. Okay, so I'll stop sharing here. Uh, should we go to physical prototyping? Um, Emily, did it work with the uh, kangaroo one? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I think it's all good. Thanks for that. Yeah, no problem. Okay. So, Tiffany, did you make something? Um, I'm in the process <laughs> of making something, um, but I can maybe quickly show because I think um, what's kind of nice with the workflow is just to get an understanding of like the directions. And um, now I've started to make something here. And um, basically it's like a, it's two of these curved folds that are kind of put next to each other, uh, but just switching in directions. It's what, it was one of also the um, 3D printed prototypes that you saw in Yassi's lecture. And so uh, I'm also trying something a bit new where I'm using duct tape, uh, which is a, like a thicker tape. And it also has um, sort of a mesh on the inside. So I was just curious like how that was going to affect the stiffness of the restrictive layer. So I'm almost done cutting this and I'll, I'll show you guys in a bit once I finish and actually do it. I think it would be a good idea to um, also like do the same simple designs in physical and digital. And then when, once you really understand also the intuition behind the physical prototypes and you can just start to like do a lot more digitally. Okay, I don't have very, um, cool samples right now, but I will start filling them. But I can also just show you, um, show you some of the samples that I showed in the, in the lecture. So this is what I showed for straight grades origami. And as we mentioned here, we need to actuate the hinges. So we need to put the bilayer here. Our hinges cannot be like a sharp line. They need to have some, some width so that it can bend here. Okay, so this is my sample. Plastic, plastic paper here. And on the other side, just plastic all over. So we have bilayer only in here. And let me spray this time and keep it like this so that the self-plate doesn't affect it too much. Well, of course, it's important how wide your hinge is. Um, I'm using a relatively thin paper, so it is uh, changing shape a lot. And my hinge is one centimeter. I think based on the amount that it, that it is bending, I might be able to even make it, um, sorry, make it a, uh, like a shorter, maybe eight millimeter, seven millimeter. If you have thicker paper where this radius is larger, then you probably need more width um, for your hinge. And I think what I'm going to do right now is that I'm going to make, um, make one uh, origami with mountain and valley folds. So I didn't draw, draw it on, on right now. I just marked my paper here. It's like four centimeter, one centimeter, four centimeter. I'm just going to put paper on it. So this is what I will do uh, next. And then I think what I think would be cool to make it live here is to make one of the curved folding samples. So I made one sample yesterday, but I didn't put water on it. It's this one. And I actually have suspicion that this will not work very well because my hinge is not so weak. I did uh, score it with my cutter a few times, but it might still be too strong. Okay, let me just say this quickly in Farsi as well, that 
اینکه اوریگامی با خط خط صاف استریت کریز اوریگامی بود و این کیس هایی که دیدیم دیگه اینجا چسب 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 و این وسط فقط خالی بودش که این بایلی روز هم درست میکنه این یکی که کرف کریز بودش من این دیروز دیروز درستش کردم ولی مطمئن نیستم که پارک کنه یا نه خاطر اینکه این هینج ممکنه که زیادی سفت باشه Okay, so I'm just going to splash with water right now and see if it, see if it folds. Yeah, okay. Seems like it is folding. And actually another thing that I want to caution you about is that in, this, in a simple pattern, such as this, I think it would work easily, but if you want to go with more complex, it needs more craftsmanship. Like you should be careful. In, in principle, nothing changes, but when you build them with the paper, you should pick a uh, thicker paper so that they can lift sulfate. You should make sure that all of your hinges are properly scratched so that they are weak but they don't tear apart and this is it so i i finished the one that i was showing earlier um with the duct tape it is so the curvature is not as much as maybe some of the ones that yassi showed because it's it's much uh stiff but i think the you can you can actually see the change right uh in direction so here uh, you're, it's like a um, undulating cur curvature here and the opposite undulating curvature here. Um, so, so maybe uh, some improvements would be to actually um, make the hinge weaker that could potentially help um, it actuate more, but I think I'm pretty happy with the way it turned out. Did you wet it? Yeah, so actually I, I'm at home today and I didn't um, have my spray bottle with me. So I, I just put it in um, this water, this um, pool of water and uh, slowly it's been kind of uh, actuating. I wiped off a, a little bit of the surface water as well. So that's not super wet. It looks like it, it's actuating even more as you're holding it. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. thicker paper, so it is going yeah. to take some time, but uh, yeah. Can, can we also show something? Yes, please. So uh, uh, I brought another set of uh, laptop and uh, I'm, I'm waiting uh, to, join the, to join the session if you want. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Oh, I, I just, okay. yeah, sorry, I didn't see. <laughs> I, was, I just admitted you. Thanks for uh, telling us. No, no, that's, that's okay. Do you see the video now? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so basically, I, I, I designed this origami a couple of years ago. And um, so we put this DXF into the into the Rhino program that you had, and we wanted to screen share the results if that's possible. Yeah. So Ali Reza would screen share then. And you should uh, host disabled participants to sharing. Oh no. Uh... Uh huh. Can you try again? Yeah. Um, this one. In Rhino, I'll be having it. Thank you. Oh, in Rhino. So the, the crease pattern is pretty simple and basic. And what well, it's. The in between, the in between, um, what do you call that? The in between 
situation might not be accurate, but, but when you collapse it completely, the result would be, uh, the result would, <laughs> okay, it's oh. now, it wasn't <laughs> what we just saw. <laughs> no, yeah, what you just saw was really beautiful. Yeah. Let's try it again. Maybe. Yeah, this is the thing. Do you also need to change the shading of the rendering shading, whatever? So the, the first try we did was pretty, what do you call it? Like, uh, if you go much, much smoother with the slider, does that work better or no? OK, so that, that is a thing. Yes. Maybe you need to just, yes. So and then slowly move it. Do we need to keep this one to true? Yeah. OK. OK, like stop, stop, stop. Yeah. Give it some time. Yeah, it looks like. Wow. Does it look right? Does it? Yeah, look yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm seeing the video on. Oh, wow. That, that's a beautiful pattern. I mean, good. Mm, yeah, pretty this. Yeah, that, this was this was I think the first time uh, we coded some some uh, we coded one of my designs. So this is pretty <laughs> exciting. Thank you. Great. Yeah, yeah, that looks amazing. Awesome. Yeah, you can change that color from pink to whatever color you want. And that swatch thing, you can change the color if you don't like pink. But... Yeah. I want to have a preview of two grasshopper. Aha, two grasshopper. I think I can be careful. I'm not going to have a screen. I'll take a grasshopper. Oh, nice. You can see the other one. I'm going to have a screen. That's really cool. Right. That's right. Yeah, thank you so much. Nice. Okay. Does anybody else have something to show? Did you start prototyping some physical or digital? I just try to. Uh, oh, yeah. This can shoot by this sudden. Rasul, that looks great for the first try. Yes, it is ripping apart, but I also have a bunch of them that are ripping. <laughs> I, I think mean, I, uh, I over pushed it yeah, around the, the paper and it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I have those too. The, the, the paper uh, is too thick and uh, I think it's yeah, and it needs lots of water actually. It is it's not uh, it is yeah. not a lot of it. <laughs> yeah. But looks great. Yeah, this is this is not easy. This problem. I mean, maybe in this workshop we come up with even better solutions to do something, the hinges, maybe uh, other technique. Uh, but yeah, this is what we're going to do. Okay. <clears throat> so I think what I will do at this moment is that I will take a few minutes and I will make this a state please origami with mountain and valley myself. Um, and you can also start making.
Emily, which, uh, which uh, are you drawing it in Grasshop, in, sorry, in Rhino? Uh, it's the, just the example from the video um, yeah. that's sitting there and I try to input the initial lines. Yeah. The other ones have worked, but I, yeah. 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 Let's, uh, okay. let's look, can you share your screen? Sure. Because I think the problem is that in the example, I drew a curve as a curve, but for the simulation, you need to discretize the curve and draw it as a bunch of lines. Oh, this one. Yeah, that the, this one. Yeah, I didn't know if you tried that one also. I was just trying yeah, actually, to actually this one I didn't try, but I sent a I sent a YouTube video. This was the original design that we yeah, I, I saw the video yeah. and so, so why I'm not sure work? why. Oh, I oh, think I might know why it doesn't work, but um I think there are some duplicate curves in there. Ah, okay. Um, because I drew is. the mountain and valley later. So what you can do is to turn off the mountain and valley curve layer. Ah, uh, oh, I see. Okay, right. I, I gotcha. Yeah, like okay. turn off. So the I think curve. I will try that. Yeah, yeah. exactly. If, if, because there were like two mountain and valley curves on top of each other and the meshing gets just uh, messed up. So turn off those layers in Rhino, input the curves, and then turn them on, input the red and blue in the... Got it. Okay, cool. Let's see. Okay, so I think it would be good if we take 10, 15 minutes to do a little bit of exercise and then we will, uh, well, like 20 minutes for the experiments and then we talk quickly about the project and the groups and what we, we are planning to do in the next days, okay? Okay, so as you will see here, I hope you can see, but um, I had marked these lines before, right? And in order to have mountain and valley on some of these hinge of, <clears throat> ah, I don't think that this camera is showing it up. But on some of my hinges, I need a bilayer to be on the convex side and some of it, the bilayer to be on the concave side. Uh, but, oh. This is just what I'm going to do right now. I hope you can watch it in the other video, but I'm just going to mark some of them so that I know where to put the tape on this side and where to put the tape on the other side. Uh, I just want to show that sample I just made. Oh, nice. Beautiful. Yeah, I like it, thank you. <laughs> That's really nice. And you know, the, the other cool thing with the curve folding is that if you program it reverse, like if you make the bilayer invert and then let it dry, it will always keep its shape, which I think is also another tricky thing. It might be a tricky thing, tricky thing. Um, but yeah, you can to like keep the bent, <clears throat> bent form in the dry state of the mix. Cool. Yeah, Fatima, do we know each other from the University of Fair? Yes. <laughs> You are just you were my teacher. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Not a teacher. I am your teacher assistant. Yes, no difference. Area. Glad to know me. Great to see you. <laughs> me too.
Okay, so I think I made my mountain and valley poles. I'm not so proud of my craftsmanship. This just looks very ugly, but uh, I just marked where my bilayer has a uh, tape so that I don't mess up the two sides. And here, then I put the tape, all the faces and the bilayers. Let's see. I don't know how to hold it. I think it's good. The hinges are a bit soft. So you see if I like tilt it like this, it can't really keep the weight. So maybe for your eye, uh, yeah, I should have folded it like this. So that the self weight is not affecting it too much. Or if I use a thicker paper, this would be less of an issue. Yeah, this is pretty good for now. Are we good? Everybody doing okay? Some of you are very silent. Oh, oh nice. I did one curve folding now. New work for you. That's nice. Yeah, you guys are doing it well. <laughs> I failed a lot when I started making. But nice. Uh, Yossi, can, can you again quickly recap the, the hinge method in, in the curve foldings? Yes, so, so go ahead. Uh, so you, you put the, the tape all on one side, but then mm -hmm. so I got a little bit confused with the last one you just made. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> so... Um, but like this one or this one the doesn't right, matter the right one the right one the other one ah, okay this one okay so uh, what i did is the hinges are just lines right mm. so here i have tape here i have paper here i have tape and then from the other side, you have paper, tape, and paper. Some people make this mechanism without like, without this kind of like self-shaping curve folding by only like bending this rib, this mid rib. Mm -hmm. So that that might be also one way, but... Um, what, how, how do you decide where to put the tape, where to put the paper when, when the pattern is more complex? Like, Miura pattern. Mm -hmm. So you have a Miura pattern. So I have like a simplified version of the pattern I just showed. So for instance, this one. So mm -hmm. how do you decide where to put the tape or the or keep it as a paper? Well, that is that is not curve crease, right? Ah, that so is it doesn't work. Crease. Okay. Yeah. So, so for that, you need to like do a method like this. For curve crease, you can only do this because the face is bent. And actually, like if you make it with paper, then you can easily see what, what faces are concave, what faces are convex, and you just put the tape okay. accordingly. So it completely is a different method when the, the uh, hinges or the fault lines aren't curved. Yeah. I got these both confused, and I, and I was a little bit confused. Yeah, I mean... Oh. I wanted to just show the curve fold, but then I thought my natural fold. But so since sorry since you, if it's confusing. Oh no, no. <laughs> so since you just showed that one, could we also recap the other one with the straight? Uh, with yes. The straight, yeah. 
So with the straight line, um, the thing is that <clears throat> with a straight line, you actuate the hinge. So you oh. need to bend the hinge. So then your hinge is not just a line. Your hinge mm. should be a piece of bilayer. And this is what we see here. So the right. faces are completely flat. Mm -hmm. And um, the way to get nice flat faces is the tape is on both sides. So it doesn't get wet, doesn't get fluffy. So on the faces, tape on both sides. On the hinges, tape on only one side. Okay. And then it. based on where the tape is, you All get right. mountain and valley. So like tape right. on this side. Yeah, so they, they are complete, they're completely different methods. There okay. are some people or some examples that they try to fold curve folding with this kind of method. Hmm. But to be honest, they are really ugly. Hmm. And the problem is that in the normal origami, this is a face that is just bending. In the curved crease, you have a curved a surface that needs to curve in the other direction, and that is just a, a your this hinge face needs to curve, um, not a not a, like curve in a, in a weird way. It needs to stretch and uh, and, and change you and can't do yeah. that. So that you. that becomes kind of ugly. If you want to do that on the curve fold, you can try it, but. There is a problem. There, there is a high probability that you have get weird creases and. And right. And would it be possible to get to the, when you were showing the presentations with the, um, I think Eric Demain's work or David Hoffman's curve foldings, would it be possible to just like um, mentally go through, if you want to make such a thing, where do you put the tape or the paper? Mm -hmm. Is that yeah. possible? I can try, yeah. And yeah, share my screen. So we can look at that slide. Okay. So Then I had this one. Oh, I can go to the other slide or I can. How do you end up filming? David Hoffman's structures. Ah, oh, God. Okay, so. The here, because we can see the folded version, you can see that this guy is concave. This one is convex. This one is concave. This one is convex. So since we can now look at the final, at the final, um, like a folded shape, we can easily uh, understand that. But we also have this rule that says that the faces should be convex, concave, convex, concave. So then you would know if you have this crease pattern, this would be convex, concave, convex, concave. So then meaning that uh, paper in the bottom, tape on top, the next one, tape in the bottom, paper on the top, and then something like that. Um, this one, it, I think it is a bit more complex because I think if we look at it, we see that, do you see my mouse? Yes. Oh, okay. You see that here on these faces, there, here it is concave, uh, convex, then it is concave, it's convex, uh, co yeah. convex, concave, and here the opposite. So this, the, this opposite thing is absolutely understandable because there is a fold line, so they should be opposite of each other all the time. So whatever you have in, on this side should be opposite of what, what you have on this side. But I think there is, there is now the inflection points here because 
This curve is in the middle is kind of a sinusoid. So on each point of this inflection, you, you draw a point here, you connect it, and you see like on this area now you have convex, here you have concave, here you have convex, here you have concave, and then the exact opposite on the other side um, to have the curve fold. So I think, yeah. Right, I mean, thank you. This is, but, but you know that the issue uh, here is that this pattern, for example, it doesn't have, um, um, it is not a part of the cylinder, right? I think here we have um, conic developable surfaces. So the, um, the ruling lines are not parallel everywhere. And this would be tricky to make it, uh, to make it with the paper. I think I have some. So as you know, as I told you yesterday, I every day I put also some papers in in the folder that we have, and it would be good to look at these papers. And I'm just looking through to see if this one is having a crease pattern similar to that. Uh, But this is this is pretty similar to what we are seeing on those corners, and here you see that the <clears throat> that the ruling line, lines are not really parallel. So I don't know what happens if you try to make it with a paper. Maybe uh, paper has enough give to kind of like um, shape into this shape into a cone because it is soft, or maybe it will fail. So I'm not sure. I think. We can try that either through the simulation uh, or by physically making to see if we, how, how we should put the ruling lines or how we should orient it on the paper or more important question, if we can make it from one piece of paper or not. All right, thank you. Thank you for the explanation. Yeah. Okay, I have a question. Um, yeah. Okay. I, I, I'm still needing to understand which way to orient the grain of the paper on these. Yeah. Um, so do you have your paper direction or something? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. Wait uh, one second. My computer has problem. Okay, so this is now the direction that your paper is bending, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have a curved fold and the curve fold is between my two hands, your faces need to bend like this. So here is my curved fold and the surfaces need to bend like this. That way, okay. Yeah, yeah. so, okay, yeah. Um, yeah, if you yeah. look at the drive, I- so I did it, yeah, I think I, you know, I did it. Oh yeah, you did it reversed, so it is just yeah, bending. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. I got it this time. Okay. Okay. So I think we only have 10 minutes. And yeah. yeah, go ahead. Can I ask one more question? So you, is it sometimes that you're putting tape on one side and not on the other, other times you're putting tape on both sides with the curve fold or do you always switch it on, on the curve fold? Um, on the curve fold, there's always paper only on one side. Because yeah. okay. if you put tape on both sides, it will not move. It just becomes a straight piece. Right. Actually, it doesn't even matter. If you put no tape at all, that would be the same. But it just right. gets more fluffy. So here is just mm -hmm. a way to protect the faces and make them more straight. Mm -hmm. But on a curve fold, um, yeah, we need bilayer everywhere. So paper plastic. And it, it'll work like this pattern would work with tape on this, not on that. And then also the reverse, yes. it would, so it would just this, bend the other direction. Yeah, it yeah, would, yeah, yeah, yeah. It yeah, would yeah, flip exactly. which way this, this exactly. goes. Okay. Okay, cool. You're making such cool things. Yeah, let me just quickly show, I, we don't have a lot of time left. It's it's also a bit slow because again, the, the thicker, the slightly thicker paper, but um, here you can see just like the curve folds now alternating. Uh, so I had the, 
the space unit um, uh, like replicated or actually inverted here. And now I'm actually um, uh, doing it in the other direction, right? So I'm actually uh, re uh, arraying it this way. Uh, so, so you can see that it sort of changes direction um, as I have this uh, more con uh, cave shape, convex shape, con uh, concave. Um, yeah, just wanted to share. Did you draw it in Rhino or did you draw by hand? I did it. Maybe. I did it by oh, hand. Sorry. Uh, Maybe but we can just draw it and put it on Rhino. It's, yeah, it's I have really actually. Uh, we we printed this before. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we have we have the geometry in Rhino. I can yeah. I can add it there. But yeah, I, I just drew it by hand, and what I did was I just um, took like a ruler and kind of measured the the um, uh, construction lines and uh, I just kind of freehanded the curves um, that's already enough but yeah if you want to do like a nicer prototype I would recommend drawing it in Rhino potentially um, printing it out or doing the on-screen tracing method that Yassi showed uh, those are all ways that you can do it but I don't have a printer at home so um, I just kind of draw the construction lines and freehand it um, but I will add the I I will add the Rhino um, drawing the drawing to the resources folder. Awesome. I can make this one too. It's really hard. Oh yay! To... Yes. Awesome. That's like nice. A... That's but... nice. Fatima, are you making that the normal paper or thick paper? This one is from normal paper, but this one from cardboard. Yeah. Yeah, it's a little bit. <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit floppy. The other one, but yes, this but one also works, so it's great. Yeah, both of them are worked. Thank you. Cool. Awesome. So, okay, guys, so we have uh, seven minutes until the official day, uh, end of our workshop. So let me, um, let us talk to you quickly about the project. Okay, so um, we gave you the most, the majority of the lectures that, that you needed to have to be able to do your own thing. And that is finishing today. So tomorrow we will also have a short lecture by Dylan but the rest of tomorrow and the day after that will be just about working on your projects. So um, whatever idea you have, whatever thing that you want to develop, uh, you bring with yourself, you come to the same meeting room, we can, um, we can get separated into um, smaller breakout rooms and we can work on these projects together. So um, if there's some issues on the digital, we will help you on the physical, we will help you. So, this will be basically, the rest will be you wanting to explore something based on the concepts you learned these two days and us trying to help you and work on it together. At the end of it, on the last day of workshop, we have a two hour session and that would be mainly on the presentation of the projects. Um, but tomorrow and the day after we will do, we will be able to do uh, more hands-on work. So I have a, a single uh, slide that I'm going to share with you, which are some points about the project. Okay, so for the project, we think it will be great if you can work on it in groups. I Are think you by... sharing something, Gassi? <clears throat> oh, am I not? No, I don't think so. Oh, no. I'm sorry. Uh, I was trying to share this. That's good. Okay, so um, we think it would be great if you can work on the groups. If you don't want to work on the groups, it is also fine to work individually, but um, that might be that 
like working the group is just more productive and we can all work together. Uh, so the best would be with groups of two or three people. But again, individual is also fine. Your project uh, should have three main pillars. Concept, uh, the motion mechanism, and the model. So by the concept, we mean this idea of that is related to adaptation and shape change that is related to a function or like a context or something. Examples of that is that is adaptive architecture, adaptive variables, adaptive products, this concept of flat packing that they described before, the concept of self-shaping and self-assembly, autonomous robotics, or many other things. I think some of them you already know by the things you saw in the lectures, and some of them you can talk through it or think through it. But this would be like just, just a conceptual idea of why you are making something shape changing. The second part is the motion mechanism. And these mechanisms are the things that we worked a lot in the past days. Kirigami inspired mechanisms, origami inspired mechanism. If origami, if it's curved folding, if it's straight folding. So this is, this is the heart of your project in terms of its shape changing, self shaping capacity. And then the last part is the model. So the way you show this project, the way you represent it is through physical model or a digital model or both. Um, physical model. So, okay, so um, you can focus on one of them if you want to really develop more of like something of your own in the digital, you're more than welcome to do that. Or if you want to work more physical and hands-on, of course you can. Um, the main, the main way of, um, of doing the physical models are, are the paper bilayer um, uh, materials or material system that we talked through uh, in the past two days. But at the same time, we also have the opportunity to 3D print some of the design. So if you have a design that is really difficult to make with the paper, um, I and Tiffany both have our printers and our materials at home. And starting tomorrow, we can try uh, printing some of, we can try printing um, some of your designs as well. So the main method for physical prototyping is the paper and plastic, but there is also the opportunity to 3D print, we do it and we share uh, photos and videos with you. Um, between about these three pillars, you can also focus on some of them more than the other. You can decide that you really want to explore this motion mechanism and explore different origami, kirigami, sorry, self-shaping origami and kirigami pattern. You're more than welcome to do that. You still need to have some sentences about your concept and you need to show some models, but you can also, um, just that based on your own interests, you can focus on some of them more than the other. And then what we will ask for you is some documentation, which is like nice photography and videography. Um, we can talk more about it in the, in the next days, but um, just you should be able to represent what, you, what you're making beautifully. So have, putting them on nice backgrounds, have nice lighting, may not make nice pictures and videos. And at the end, we can also help with some editing of the videos for you. And then the presentation, which we will give you a template for that, that you can just get in the slides. So this is about the group project. Um, you see in the shared folder, uh, in the shared Google Drive folder on the first page, there is a participants list, it's a Google sheet. And we thought that that would be a good way that you can like match with each other. Maybe you can, tonight you can think, what are your interests, what you want to do for your project more individually and fill it in that sheet. And then tomorrow, early tomorrow, you can team up with the others who have similar interests to you. You can also write about your background. So feel free to write down anything you want in that sheet, which you think might help you find teammates. And that is it. So, uh, let me just say it quickly also in Farsi. Uh, for Jaha, 
گروهی میخوان که پروژه گروهی باشه ترجمه گروه های دو تا سه نفره هرچند که تکی هم میشه این کار میتونیم پروژه بدیم این کاری انجام بدیم ولی خب گروهی باشه بهتره پروژه شما باید سه تا المنت اصلی داشته باشه یکیش کانسپت یکیش مکانیزم و آخرش هم مدله کانسپت این چیز یه مقدار مفهومی از این جهت که چرا شما دارین یک چیزی که ادپتبل یا شیپ چنجینگ دیزاین می‌کنید به چه دردی می‌خوره چه اپلیکیشنی داره اوکی علی آی ول فیکس دات آی ول فیکس دات ایس اپ در از پرابلم ویت ایدیش پس این اولی که کانسپت ایدت رو مثلا میماری پاسخگو چیزهای پوشیدنی پروڈکت هایی که خودشون خودشون رو شیپ میدن از جور چیزا قسمت دوم مجموع مکانیزم همین چیزهایی که این روزا دیدیم در مورد اوریگامی در مورد کیگامی و چجوری اینا ترکیب کنیم با این بندینگ بای لیرا و قسمت سوم هم مدل یک درست میکنیم مدل دیجیتال یا فیزیکال با پیپر کاغذ یا بخش کاغذ و چست نباری یا مدل دیجیتال و اگر که مدلی که داریم سخته که با پیپر درست شه یه چیز خیلی باحالیه ما قابلیتی داریم که یه سری از کارها رو پرینت کنیم بالاخره ما هم یکی دو روز رو وقت داریم پرینتینگ هم طول میکشه چیزی نیست که بتونیم مثلا اطمینان بدیم که به همه دیزاین رو میرسیم ولی این هم چیزیه که میتونیم انجام بدیم حداقل یکی دو تا نمونه رو پرینت کنیم که توی شوکیس نهایی داشته باشیم. Sorry and thanks for being patient. And I updated I... the permissions of the sheet. I guess that's that was the problem. Great. So now everyone can edit it. Okay. So do you have any questions? Can I ask a quick uh, question? Oh. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, just a quick, yeah, and a, a quick one. Do they normally dry in in their actuated shape? Like once it dries, does it stay that way? So this was one of the topics that we discussed yesterday. Um, okay. Let me answer to you after. Yeah, Do that's you have fine. a few more yeah. minutes to stay? Maybe? Yeah, I can, I can stay a little bit, yeah. Okay. So Ali, you can go ahead now. Uh, the quick question is about this design. So it's a little bit different than the one uh, you showed. It, it doesn't arrive at these two points. Uh, uh -huh. So I put the tape in here and in here in this curved crease. I'm not sure if, if I did it correctly or not. So it's, it only has tapes yeah. in, the, in this um, uh, in between. Uh, in between. Yes, uh, only on the hinges, right? Right. So this is curved crease, but, but trying the, the back, method. Maybe the back needs hinge or back needs tape on the opposite side. So I think uh, uh, Yasi said in the curved crease we don't put the put the tape on the back, or I'm wrong. Um, not not on but every. Uh, so oh, okay, okay, have, the so, opposite. Yeah, the so it's like right. right. So okay. it's like that. What we did yesterday. So if we want a face bending this way, then we only have tape, let's say on on one side. And if it's bending this way, then we have to tape on the back side. So, okay. but then what what Yassi showed with the straight fold, we actually have um, tape on both sides of the non-active faces, and and then we have this bilayer on the uh, hinge. Got it. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I think what you're showing is a curved, is a curved crease pattern, but for trying to uh, like folding with this method. But I don't know why it's. It, it's not curved enough, but I. I, I Ali, like, do you yeah. think your fiber direction is correct? Paper fiber direction. Uh, mm, so. Mm, or is when it I, when I put when I made from this paper, I I try to take that in into consideration but maybe i i i wasn't careful enough when i cut the paper at the end it yeah. might be so yeah. one might be that and then yeah like this method of careful it's just like a single line and then right uh, yeah and uh, you can you can look at them i shared the slides so you can look at them later uh, i think that those should be helpful yeah thank you 
which which technique are you using? Just wondering, are you using the straight fold technique on the curved fold? Or are you, you asking, doing? Are you yeah, yeah, me? yeah. So <laughs> I mistakenly didn't use the negative positive kind of uh, taping. So I, I meant I meant to use the curved uh, curved crease technique. Okay, I think for the curved crease, usually it it works better if you have a sharp, like a, uh -huh. if you score it. Where, because when I saw yours, it looked a little bit like you um, were trying to make the uh, bending hinge. Mm -hmm. um, whereas I think it works a lot better if you actually uh, weaken the curve fold with a with a knife, mm -hmm. and um, and then put this uh, put the tape on uh, alternating sides. Right. I used this one. Uh, it wasn't a knife, but I used this bone folder kind of thing to to weaken uh but i think you really need to either uh -huh. or you bend it because when you bend the paper it also um has a little bit of a mechanical um weakening of the paper uh so if you don't have like an exacto knife you can also just bend it because you know when you bend paper it it permanently creases it or permanently deforms it uh, but i use i use a knife yeah thank you for the tip yeah, what you showed, Ali, is kind of a mix of uh, of like this and this, as it has like, I mean, it's okay for exploration. But yeah, if you want to do the, do this, just to look at the slants. Questions? Anybody? Sabo, Van. So just to confirm before we meet again tomorrow, you should just fill out that um, Google Sheets form and think about what we want to work on for the group project. Yeah, at least some ideas so that we can team up tomorrow. And okay. Sounds good. Hey, Saba. I I make this and I don't know if it that's is nice. That's good, but maybe your hinges are a bit too stiff. Mm -hmm. On one side of it is it's good, it's really good. Um actually it's nice. Thank you. And I made a mistake. Uh, I think the direction of uh, <laughs> the paper. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. This but that goes really disappointing <laughs> because, like, this is such beautiful. But if you mix yeah. the direction, yeah. it will just go like this, like this. Uh -huh. and this. Yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> oh, really nice. Yay, Emily! <laughs> yeah, I got, I got one. <laughs> Awesome. Work, work out. Oh yeah, this is nice. Looks nice. Looks nice. Yeah, Ali, I think if you change the, the, the paper direction, you will be able to, to make it with, with this other method. And I think you also will be able to see that the hinge is not so nice. It, like tries to bend in two directions, both this direction and the other direction, and just like it's creased but is it are you doing a um is that a thicker thickened crease or is that actually just a thinner panel that's supposed to be that's uh, how i understood you it's a thinner panel actually so it's yeah. a, no sorry uh, i made a mistake then Ooh. so it's like a mounting fold and then a valley fold but but maybe too thin mm -hmm. to uh, two thing to go through, and also the curve is not too curvy. Then I totally misunderstood. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I made something like that before, so that's why I recognize your thing. Huh? Seems like it would work, though. Then can you show it again? Then maybe, oh, maybe your hinges are not weak enough. Mm. 
that might be a problem. Your hinges are not so sharp. Yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe I can also show the what would it be in terms of. Yeah, now I completely got it. Like now I got the idea. But I think that the issue is might be with the fiber direction as well, but definitely in the hinges that are okay. That so don't just, look sharp. Just to be sure, uh, so is it is it the direction should should it this is the direction that the um, um yes. the fiber should be? Yes, okay. exactly. Okay. Give me one second and let me show you something. Kind of like a some section of the sky, huh? Yeah, yeah, exactly. These places way shorter. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's beautiful. But did you guys also develop an algorithm to decide how to print these? Like now we're talking about putting tapes and different techniques with the paper. But when, when you're talking about making it practical and printing, I think it's a whole another story, right? It's, is there any, any computational thing that decides? Yeah, I think it's very, it's very similar though. Um, there's a little bit more um, customization, but essentially the idea is the same where you have like the rulings going in the same direction mm -hmm. yeah but we do have this this workflow that like we decide the grain direction and it automatically generates the printing files and stuff and that is something you can find in our paper so we uploaded it in the folder now, and you can also Google it, soft shaping curve folding. And it also has a video that shows you this like grasshopper workflow from studying to simple simulation to printing. Great. Awesome. Okay, guys, don't feel pressured to stay. It's way uh, after five already. So uh, you can go, we can stay to talk more in Farsi. Uh, actually, this is what I wanted to ask the, the Persians here. Do you guys, if you guys have, if you agree with it, we can stay longer today or start earlier tomorrow. می توانیم الان نیم ساعت یه ساعت بیشتر بمونیم یا می توانیم فردا نیم ساعت یه ساعت دوتر شروع کنیم اگر که به قسمت های از لکچر می توانیم صحبت کنیم اجازه به طور کلی هم از فردا که دیگه می بیشتر توی صحبت های شخصی و پروژه رو کارای شخصی خوب می توانیم فارسی حرف بزنیم دیگه یعنی تو سرویز آینده مثلا از این بهتر خواهد بود ولی می خواهد قبل از اینکه به پروژه بریم یه جوره I'm about to finish. Okay, yeah. I'm about to finish. Okay. Alan, your Fardo. Fardo, finish. Okay, yeah. I'm not very Okay. Okay. Yeah, خودتون خسته نیستین؟ میتونیم مثلا پنگ دقیقه ده دقیقه بریم و بیایم ولی خب فردا شاید کمتر خسته میشن ولی نمیدونم آخه مثلا فردا میشه تو طول روز تو وقت ایران شاید راحت نباشه بخواه تون اگه به سآل اینطوری میگم اگه فردا اوکی این فردا من همین میتیم به ساعت یک ساعت زودتر شروع میکنم و اون موقع جنش. خوبه؟ بذاریم فردا که شما هم کمتر خسته باشیم بس یه okay. okay, sorry people um, we just decided to have like half an hour, one hour tomorrow to talk a little bit about lectures in Farsi uh, before getting to the projects and the scripts so that there are like no points uh, missing 
and we promised the bilingual workshop. We didn't do so well, I'm sorry. We tried to make up for it. You did a great job. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I will stop the live stream now. I think that would be...